everyone, welcome to you talking to me, the Yearnet Plus debate. Following his promises of fighting globalization and putting America first, one of the first measures Trump has implemented right after arriving to the White House has been leaving the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. There is a lot of uncertainty also in Europe about how the trade relationship between the United States and the e European Union is going to evolve as he claimed he won't sign the TTIP, the famous free trade deal between the United States and the European Union. It's my pleasure to welcome here our guest today. I would like to welcome uh, Christopher Fielner. Thank Hello you. and welcome. Thanks for being here. And I would like to welcome Sajad Karim. Uh, he's a member of the European Conservative uh, Party and he's from the United Kingdom. And you're a member of the centre-right party, Europe European People's Party, and you're from Sweden. Exactly. Thanks both for being here. So yeah. my first question, I would like to start with you. After the Brexit referendum um, and the uncertainty it may bring to the United Kingdom, some politicians in your country and some media have claimed that actually Trump's election can bring some hope in the sense that uh, he will give, as he's, Trump said, uh, he will give a preferent treatment or a uh, he will be, the United Kingdom will be treated fantastically. This is what he said. Do you agree with this hope? Well, he's said several things during his election campaign and since he's come to power, he's started to act on some of those things. Uh, it's quite clear that his strategy is entirely, uh, very narrowly focused, and that is America first. He will only do what is in America's interests and what benefits America within any particular agreement. So it's very much a transactional sort of arrangements that he is looking for. The United Kingdom, of course, cannot open negotiations on trade until we have left the European Union. So in the meantime, the very most that can take place is an agreement to have negotiations for an agreement. So I think it's far too early to say, by the time we are in a position to start negotiating with the United States of America, it will be after the middle of 2019 at the very earliest. And then from that point onwards, of course, uh, we will see how things develop, but Trump will have been in power um, for some time by then. So we will have a much clearer indication of what he can and cannot do. And I suspect Trump himself may may have much more of a clearer idea of what it actually means to be president of the most powerful nation on the earth by then. Mm -hmm. But Trump has declared sort of his love for the United Kingdom. Do you think this can turn into facts and that he might give sort of a preferential treatment to the, U the United Kingdom over the European Union? Trump as an individual with a love for a country is one thing. When you become the leader of the most powerful country in the world, you have a very different role to play. And I think his mind will concentrate on a variety of other factors as he learns his role whilst going through time. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? Uh, I have a lot of opinions. First of all, I think <laughs> in that... In this specific question. Yeah, but, but I, I think in general that... that if Trump really means to put America first, I think I really have to revisit his agenda a little bit because I think a lot of the things that he proposes will hurt America tremendously. Creating trade conflict and trade war with all and everything will will be extremely detrimental to the to the U.S. economy. Uh, and, and even though I, I can understand that he and not understand, but I, I can see where he comes from when he tries to exploit the feeling among many Americans that, that you know, times are changing and, and that globalization has hurt us. By, but by feeling, even though they feel run over by globalization, by backing up over them once more, it won't really help them to withdraw from all of this. And take the, uh, I should, if I were British uh, right now looking at negotiations with the, with the US, I would be a little bit careful of two reasons. First of all, it's actually hard to start negotiations with anybody, not only due to the negotiations with the European Union, but only also due to the fact that you have to sort out the British relationship with the WTO. Because before you actually know what you have offered everybody else in the world through the WTO, it's hard to say that I'll give you, I'll give a preferential agreement with the US or Australia or whoever. And secondly, when, when meeting in these negotiations, considering the situation Britain is, Britain is a kind of a weak spot right now uh, entering these negotiations, uh, while the Americans would then be very powerful. Uh, and today, Britain has a huge trade surplus with the US. So from an old traditional mercantilist perspective, it's hard to see how Britain could, could benefit a lot when going into these negotiations. Mm -hmm. 
I would like to welcome in this debate a question coming from one of the, our Euronet uh, E Plus members. So I would like to listen to the question coming from Italy, from our colleague Gigi Donelli, working for Radio, Radio 24. Hello to everybody from Milano. Yes, actually, my question is uh, the following. Do you think Donald Trump is trying to divide the European Union by promising a trade agreement with the UK and rejecting the TTIP? Classic position of divide and conquer. So a classic, I would say, uh, from a very Italian point of view. So the US is stronger when negotiation uh, is bilateral and when it's able to negotiate bilateral agreement than when negotiating with the European Union as a bloc. What do you think about? Thank you very much. Yeah, well, divide and conquer, as our colleague was saying. From Trump's perspective mm -hmm. and point of view, I think it is very clear. Um, he not only wants to divide the European Union, actually he wants to destroy the European Union. And that is why he is quite happy working with people like Nigel Farage, mm -hmm. with people like uh, Marine Le Pen and uh, Guy de Wilders and others. But from a UK standpoint, let us be absolutely clear about one thing. We have no interest in seeing the European Union weakened and we will not work with Trump towards that end. We will not allow the United Kingdom and any potential trade negotiations with the US to be used to weaken the European Union. That is not our agenda and that is not something that we are going to be a part of. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I think one should be careful when assessing uh, and, 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 and declaring uh, the trade negotiations between the EU and the UK, uh, the EU and the US, dec declare them dead because Trump didn't e actually even mention uh, these negotiations during the election campaign. And, and up until now, okay, the, the mentioning of them have disappeared from the White House webpage, but, but there hasn't been a clear message saying that we shouldn't do this. And, uh, you mean they're talking about TTIP? A TTIP, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, uh, so therefore, I, I, would, I would be surprised if there would be any big movement anytime soon. But on the other hand, we knew that no matter who would have been elected, that we've had to, have to freeze the negotiations. And normally, no American president starts free trade negotiations in the beginning of his mandate. So, so in a sense, the fact that we have that TTIP is put on hold is due to the fact that we missed the deadline. <laughs> the deadline we all knew were there. But he has said quite clearly that he prefers bilateral agreements with the specific countries. Yeah, but, but, but the trade agreement between the EU and the US is a bilateral one because we are, in, in a trade sense, we are one market. So it's one market doing a deal with the other market. What I can, I can understand that, and one had to remember the edge when he said that, what he was aiming at was criticizing TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was the context in which he said that he doesn't like these plurilateral agreements that we, he were doing with TPP. So therefore, I, I think that the question we should ask ourselves when the, about TTIP and free trade negotiations at all is rather, are we open for business? Are we ready to do negotiations? Considering the, all the challenges and problems we have with agreeing to, to the Canada free trade agreement, if I were in Washington, I might not listen to Trump and think about that. I might look at Europe and say, okay, but are they really up to the task to ratify anything that we agree upon? We can't control or affect what Trump does that much. But what we can do is to prepare and see to that we are open for business when opportunity comes. So what should be the, the attitude of the European Union? Because as you mentioned, uh, he wants to, I don't know if he wants to destroy the European Union, but at least he said that he predicted that the European Union mm. will fall apart and he would not really care about it. So yeah, kind of he has declared his hostility towards the European Union. What should be the attitude towards him, like an offensive attitude or just wait and see what's going on? I, I think Christopher has been far too kind uh, about mm. President Trump. Uh, when he says that he uh, uh, has declared his dislike for plura pl plural mm. uh, relations, um, he was very clear. He actually said, in very clear terms, I heard it myself, he said, I hate the European mm -hmm. Union. Mm. Okay? When somebody makes a comment of that sort, it's very difficult to then think they're going to want to sit down and do an agreement with you. And I agree completely when Christopher says that there is a huge need for investment of political capital if we are going to see TTIP finalized. 
And or any go, trade agreement. Or, or any, yeah. but you know, we're talking specifically about mm. TTIP here. But when one then looks at what he has done uh, across the Pacific and withdrawn uh, the USA um, from that mm -hmm. uh, agreement, then you get a very clear indication that he is entirely focused on bilateral rather than multilateral uh, mm -hmm. agreements uh, taking mm -hmm. place. Now, so far as that is concerned, I think he's going to learn a, a, a lesson very, very soon because as of yesterday morning, the other countries that were a part of the Pacific Agreement have made it clear. The USA asked mm -hmm. to be a part of that and having asked to be a part of it, the USA is today pulling out. It doesn't mean that it comes to an end. No. So, so the dimensions are much greater than yeah. what Mr. Trump realizes. This is what I mean. It's not just about works. We have seen already some facts. So um, I was listening the other day an interview with uh, a person who worked with Mr. Trump mm -hmm. and said that this is part of Trump's strategy of somehow creating, like being very provocative, creating some tension and some nervousism, so he plays with advantage. Is this Trump's strategy and then at the end he will turn to be not that bad or? I, again, I, I think if we go back, if, if we look at, mm -hmm. at, at the other candidates that's been around, like, like Hillary Clinton and her proposals for trade, Honestly, okay, the tonality and, and the way she presented them, very different, but the substance, not that different. If we, if we look to Obama, what he presented in 2008, again, okay, he didn't want to slap the China with 45% tariff, but he said we should have huge tariffs because they are currency manipulators. He didn't want to withdraw from, from, from TPP, it didn't exist, but he wanted to renegotiate NAFTA. There, there's a lot of, the difference is that when they said it, we all said, but we don't believe you will do it. But now we expect him to do it. And as you say, you can see some indications that when he was early on in the process, he said that, yeah, sure, I will, I will withdraw from TPP. I will <laughs> renegotiate NAFTA. But maybe, I, I heard somebody f f from Washington lately saying that, okay, but renegotiating NAFTA, maybe he'll pick up some of the pieces of P TPP because that is actually a renegotiation of NAFTA. TPP is that. So, so to see what actually will be the outcome of this. I think it's too early to say. Uh, but but am, I, am I concerned? Most definitely. And I think the biggest concern I have is the fact that he doesn't seem to realize that the words of the American president, they matter in themselves, no matter if he actually delivers upon it. That he, as you say, create a lot of nervous and, and affects trade. And investment. So very quickly, the European Union should then wait and see, or we should take the initiative and do something about it? Yeah, honestly, wait and see. What can we do, especially as, as nothing has happened mm -hmm. in real terms vis-a-vis -vis us, and support the WTO, support a multilateral rule-based trade, which he, at least in words, have threatened. Okay. Those are the things we can do, I think. I would like to include another question coming this time from Germany. It's a question coming from our colleague Olger Winkelmann from the German radio AMS. Nothing is as bad as it looks. That was one reaction of the German car industry to the threats of Donald Trump referring to possible punitive tariffs if they do not build cars in the US. But of course, they take it seriously. But a real reaction is missing until now. So, what do you think? Is to sit and wait the right answer? Or are the threats maybe even a chance to bring back more production to the home bases of the German and European car industry? So, in your opinion, how should Germany react to this threat? Well, um, the, the car industry from Germany has been a big part of the debate in the UK recently as well. And then, of course, now latterly with uh, Donald Trump, President Trump's uh, remarks that have been made. The, the way I see this, actually, is that uh, the car industry, uh, actually, at this moment in time, doesn't have much choice but to try and allow the short term... Uh, period to allow it to consolidate its position before making more strategic decisions about what it does uh, in the coming 24, 36 months. Because within that time frame, you will get a very clear indication from Donald Trump and the USA as to what they expect. And secondly, also the Brexit negotiations will be much further as well. At the moment, there are far too many unknowns for any strategic decisions to be made. So my advice to anybody in the car industry at this moment in time would be just consolidate your position for now, carry on with what you have been doing for now, and then as circumstances become clearer, then make your strategic decisions.
Mm -hmm. um, do you see this as a possible beginning of a trade war? Uh, if it would, if it if would it become would... reality, of course, you know, if, if it would be. But I mean, but... I guess Germany will react in a similar way, no? Then is when we have a trade war. Yeah, sure. Uh, on top of everything else that he will do with them, vis-à-vis -vis China and Canada and Mexico, so, you know, and that's the reason I think that that at the end of the day, delivering upon this will will hurt the U.S. economy so massively. Uh, not only due to the fact of retaliation, also to the mere fact that they are dependent upon imports. And and if I were part of the car industry, I I, I would start by educating American legislators and Mr. Trump, uh, President Trump, about reality. The fact is that many, like BMW, many car producers produce more European cars in the USA than they actually export mm. from, from Europe to the USA. BMW, I think, is a net exporter from the USA because we have manufacturing there. And if you would renegotiate NAFTA, for example, and, 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 and destroy the supply chains between, between Mexico, US and Canada, it would be devastating for the US car industry. So therefore, I think that when, when push comes to shove, it would be hard for me to see him actually deliver upon that if he want to be re-elected. And that tends to come naturally to politicians. But uh, in the short term, as you were mentioning, what should Germany do? do should they build the plant in the United States and in order to avoid a conflict with um, President Trump or not? Because that might set a precedent. I say, say it is completely right that to, to do something now on the basis of a tweet <laughs> would, be, would be utterly irresponsible. Sit and wait and tell people about the reality. If you try to make war on trade, you make war on jobs, you make, make war on, on economic growth, and that's the risk that Trump would lead to. Uh, and there are, of course, the foreign policy considerations as well, because, for instance, with uh, TPP, one of the reasons why the USA was so keen to be involved mm. was because of the Chinese factor mm. in that part of the world. Now, if President Trump is completely surrendering the US influence in that part mm. of the world through trade, then there are going to be foreign policy repercussions from that. And I think that is going to teach him and other lawmakers a very real lesson that if they start treating Europe in the same way, then that foreign policy agenda is going to shift against them as well. Yeah. So there are so many other considerations that are going to come. I'm afraid at this moment in time, the current administration in the USA is treating trade as something that works in isolation from everything else. And very soon they are going to realize that actually it doesn't. Actually, it's linked also with international security and, and from Absolutely. The All of these things are interlinked. But when you have somebody who has a transactional mentality only, they tend to see things in isolation. Yeah. Uh, and being president of the United States of America is completely different to running a business. And, and that is something that's going to dawn upon the current administration. Yeah, nah. do, do you I, think I, it's I, because he's ignorant? or? <laughs> I would never call the US president ignorant in that sense, even though when reading his tweets from time to time, you could have that impression. But, but I also think the fact that he's caught in this old, and not only he, but a lot of people is caught in this old mercantilist perspective on trade policy, that kind of exports is good, imports are bad, we have to stop the imports and promote our exports. While in reality, in modern trade and globalization, supply chains is, is crucial. And the fact that you're able to import things to actually be a better exporter. And that is something that's completely missing. But with his trend, trade agenda, which part of it has to go through Congress, and you can see powerful congressional leaders like, like uh, McCain, for example, in, for example, coming out strongly against it. I think a lot of it will be hard to deliver upon. But, but still, with that said, am I worried? Most definitely. I'm mostly worried if he hurts the rule-based trade system while withdrawing or don't res not respecting WTO, and if he kind of withdraws, and as Said said, the the the, that China fills the void of U.S. as a global, you know, power mm -hmm. in trade policy. Okay, so I'm afraid we are running out of time. Thanks so much uh, to both for being here. As we said for the moment, at least concerning the European Union and the UK, it's just words. So we, whenever we have facts, we will uh, be here again in order to analyze. Happy, the facts. Happy back. <laughs> Happy to. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice evening. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.